But I'm going to talk to you about our perceptions of glaucoma. Now, if you look at pamphlets, advertising, public information about glaucoma, this is what you see, right? I'm sure you've all seen these brochures. There's a black tunnel, there's a black tunnel, there's a black tunnel. That's how we convey what glaucoma looks like. And probably for 100 years, that's what we've been telling all you folks out there, right? This is what it looks like, this is what it looks like. But the question is, does it matter what we're telling people it looks like? Well, it does, because if you don't think the world looks like that, you may not think that you have that disease. And if you don't think you have the disease, you might think, well, I don't need to be like John and take drops for 40 years. They're annoying, they're expensive, I keep forgetting them, they're irritating. Does it matter? It actually does, because the perception of what the condition looks like is going to influence your behaviour if you're diagnosed. I like this thing here, denial is uh, cheaper than therapy. It doesn't work with all of it. Um, so I'm going to acknowledge a colleague of mine. This is Professor Alan Crabb. He uh, trained uh, in Oxford and in Sheffield, works at the City University of London. He's a professor of statistics and vision research. That's an interesting combination. Alan's a lovely guy, and his background is this. He's a pure mathematician. And I think that's one of his genius aspects, because he can come at our field from a different perspective. He's not medically trained, he's not biologically trained, he's a mathematician. And so he looks at the world in a very pure and simple way. And what Alan was interested in is that if we look at visual fields, and you know, and I know none of you like doing this test, that's a given, right? It's the worst thing you've ever done. But basically what the visual field does is it tries to map out the bits that are missing. And what Alan realised is we measure the visual field of one eye at a time, right? You sit there and they cover it up and you're pressing that button, you can't see anything, you press it in, and you do it for the other eye. So we measure two different eyes, but the brain doesn't work one eye at a time. The brain mixes them together. So what he thought of, okay, we have the visual fields, if we merge them together, that's really what the patient see. And therefore, can that give us some information about what the perception is? Now, Catherine, I'm going to get you to play this. Just listen to the volume. Whoop, the back of that. And yeah, down there. Yeah, maybe I have to click. That's it. Good. Okay. To test just how much attention the attention stealing design of the new Skoda Fabia actually steals, we left one parked on this ordinary road in West London. We wanted to see if its sharp crystalline shapes, bold lines and lower, wider profile would attract the desired level of attention. Will the 17-inch black alloy wheels stop passers-by in their tracks? Will the angular headlights attract the attention of other road users? Will a crowd gather to check out its fresh, sporty look? Well, not quite. But did the attention ceiling design distract you from noticing that the entire street has been changing right before your very eyes? Don't believe us? Have another look. Did you spot the van changing to a taxi? How about the scooter changing to a pair of bicycles? Or the lady holding a pig? Let alone the fact that the entire street is now completely different. Didn't think so. So there we have it. Proof that the new Skoda Fabia is truly attention stealing. <laughs> now, I have no financial interest in Skoda or in vehicles, but it's a very clever ad because it shows how perception changes over time. And if you're focused on one thing, you really don't know what's happening around. And that's the trick of glaucoma. What's happening is around, it's not in the middle. And that's why it sneaks up on you. So this is a research that uh, um, David published in a very prestigious journal, Ophthalmology. And this is a few years ago. And uh, essentially what he did is he went to uh, Moorfields Eye Hospital, which is another place that I trained, and he got about 50 patients. Average age was 70, a pretty good representation of people with glaucoma. And this was the range of vision loss. So minus 20 means really bad, severe glaucoma. Zero means not much glaucoma. So there's a range of patients, most in this sort of mild to moderate disease range. So we've got a fair cross-section 
of people with glaucoma. And then there's a few things that he did. He asked them, what has glaucoma done to your vision? So he literally said, how does it affect your vision? Are you aware of that defect? What does it look like and how does it impact on your daily life? He actually did two things. He asked them to pick words that describe what glaucoma does. And then he asked them to look at pictures and try and, with the picture, describe what the impact on the vision was. So this is what's called a forced choice test. So you have a panel of different images and you're told, right, this is the normal picture and this is the one simulating the disease. So which one do you think it looks like? This is the first test. So this was the original. So the first thing David did is he put up the black tunnel, right? The, the current marketing image we have to walk home. And he asked the patients, okay, does this match what you see? And these were patients, remember, who had glaucoma, they had some vision loss. So there were bits missing in their vision fields. So that was the first one, right? The black tunnel. The second one he did was, same area of defect, but blurred rather than black. So the second false choice was, this is the original, is that what your glaucoma looks like? Yeah? The third one he did was what's called black patches. So it wasn't that the whole thing is blurry, but bits are missing, and the bits are the classic black appearance. So is this what your glaucoma looks like? Do you see patches in your vision? Choice number four was the same patches, but instead of being black, they're just blurred. So if we go back here for a second, it's pretty subtle. So these are the bits that are missing. So imagine you do your visual field test and you've got some black areas. This is putting both eyes together and saying, okay, those are the bits that are affected. So if instead of being black, it actually was just a bit fuzzy. Right? So when you ask them, is this what your glaucoma looks like? And the next question was, the same patches, but they're not fuzzy. I'm going to go back again because this is really tricky. Black patches, fuzzy, blurry patches, it's missing. So you can see that this bit's gone, this bit's gone, this bit's gone. It's the same as the black patches, but it doesn't look that obvious now. Yeah? So these are different interpretations of what we expect glaucoma may look like but you're the expert. So what I like about his research is he was asking you. He wasn't trying to figure it out himself. So what did we find? Look at this. The majority of people said that they noticed the blurred patches or bits missing. And a lot of people were not even aware that there was anything wrong with their vision. No one picked the black tunnel. So of these 50 glaucoma patients who are in Moorfields Eye Hospital in the glaucoma clinic, None of them said that they will kind of look like that. And a small number said that, yeah, it was a bit of a blurred tunnel around it, but by far most of them said that it's blurry or missing or I didn't even realise. This is really powerful stuff because when you look at the severity of the disease, so once again, this basically is showing um, the, uh, the most severe disease here. So if you're on the bottom of this graph, you've got really bad glaucoma. If you're on the top of the graph, you haven't got bad glaucoma. But of the people who had the blurred vision, it was the whole spectrum. People with a little bit of glaucoma to a lot of glaucoma. And yet they all described this blurred bit. People who had the blurred tunnel, they were more severe. So that's probably why they described the whole area. Missing parts also, the whole range, a little bit of glaucoma, a lot of glaucoma. People who weren't aware, from a little to a lot. So this is a really hard thing to grasp the changes of vision that you are experiencing are not easy to explain or describe, but they're there. The second part of his research, as I said, was asking, what does it mean to you? How does it affect you? So this is what's called a word. Of. The bigger the text, the more people answer that word. So you can see the biggest thing they're saying is it affects them in terms of their driving and their reading. So the question was, how does glaucoma affect your life? So driving was a significant impact. Reading was another impact. But as you can see, there's all aspects of life there. Bumping into things, shopping, stairs, walking. And these are all aspects of life that you don't think classically in terms of tunnel vision. They're just things that you do. And yet, when your vision's going, everything gets affected. 
And then the other question that he asked was, what do you see? And the number one word was missing. There's things missing. Oh, no one, I don't think tunnel is even there. No. So no one said tunnel. No one, some people said a bit of black stuff. Blurring, double vision, blind spots. Yep. So if you think back to how we perceived glaucoma to be from your perspective, and yet when we ask you, you're actually telling us it's none of those things. It's all of these things. So that's important because firstly, it goes to what glaucoma feels like to you, right? What's your perception? So your awareness is important because as we said on the earlier slide, if you're not aware of what the problem is, you may not think there's a problem at all. And if you don't think there's a problem at all, you're not going to be bothered taking the drops. If that's positioned, it's important because if we don't understand your awareness, then we can't help you with the denial because it's like, well, there's a problem. I've got a field test here. It says there's a problem, right? It's <laughs> not as simple as that. And then we may not understand the issues about compliance. Compliance is taking the drops. That's the number one problem in any chronic, incurable, progressive disease. What are chronic, incurable, progressive diseases? Glaucoma, diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterol, all of these big things that affect us that we don't like taking treatment for because we don't see that they're making any difference. So it's really important to put ourselves in your shoes and try and understand what's happening. This is a video of something that David created. Now, I want you to watch this kitchen scene. This is showing what's happening with the patient's vision. One eye, the visual field is getting worse. Nothing really changes. So the vision is still good. The second eye starts to go. And as that second eye starts to go, things start to drop off, right? Cupboards are going. The microwave's gone. And when you've got a little bit of vision, you've got that little bit left. And the kitchen looks dead. So this is really the way that we're trying to move glaucoma education towards, showing people how subtle it is, how sneaky it is. Glaucoma is called the sneak thief of sight for good reason. If you saw that happening to your kitchen, you'd either think that you were um, uh, saving a lot of money by not buying all those unnecessary things that my wife does about it, or you think someone was coming in and licking stuff. But that's what glaucoma does, it sneaks up on you. I'm particularly passionate about this because one of my roles is uh, not with really wings on, but I do work with the Royal Flying Doctor Service, and I have the privilege of working in the outback. This is uh, our clinic in Burke. These are some of our patients. We've got good old bush cockies, and we've got a lot of indigenous patients. The aim of our service is to take our treatment out to these communities because it's not easy for them to make it here. Um, Fred started this at the Prince of Wales Hospital. He used to go out to Burke. He used to literally climb out the window of his um, clinic, of my clinic, get in the Land Rover and just bugger off. Right? That was his genius. So we have now taken it to um, a level where we look after two thirds of New South Wales. Um, we're the only public service in this entire area. Uh, we cover, it's only 125,000 people, but it's across an area, oh, I keep doing that, the size of France. So as I say, when I go and give these talks in Europe, you guys are fussing about, you know, having specialists here and there. I look after France, I'm not worried. <laughs> um, and the way we get there is with the flying doctors, but the, the, the trick really is, is about awareness. Fred's genius was about making things simple, going out and just doing the work, not worrying about a thousand committees and research proposals. Um, and, uh, and arguably the biggest difference that Fred made in the bush was getting these in, swimming pools and piped water. Because when Fred went out there in the 70s, trachoma was the big blinding disease. How do you fix trachoma? You get clean running water. And that's what's wiped it up. I've been working in these places for over 20 years. I haven't seen trachoma forever. And that's not because of anything we've done. It's because of the engineers. They've gone out, they've put piped water, they've got services up there. It's just incredible. This is a lovely lady of ours from Lightning Ridge who's coming for surgery in Burke. There's no time to go on it now, but one of my passions is trying to improve access to care for these people. Surgery is changing at a dramatic pace. It's something hopefully none of you will ever need, but if you do, we want to be able to offer new things, and I need to be able to offer things for my patients out in places like this, who I can't get to Sydney or the Prince of Wales or Sydney Eye Hospital, and a lot of the work is about really researching better ways of doing this. 
So as you drive off into the sunset, I think you'll still get the sunset there, um, I want you to be aware of the fact that you have a condition that is treatable, controllable, and as John shows you, it doesn't stop you having a good life. But we're learning now through your eyes what it means to have glaucoma. Hopefully that'll make us better doctors so we can look after you better. Um, and I commend the work of Glaucoma Australia because it's really awareness that is the key. 50% of cases still in this, one of the richest countries in the world, with a developed education and health system are undiagnosed. So God help those in places where I work, like Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, India, where they don't have those facilities. Yep. So you are our ambassadors. You are the wave of people who go out there and tell the story of glaucoma and show people that you don't know really you'll have it because you'll see things missing in the kitchen. You won't pick bits of, the, of your vision that are missing. So you really have to have it looked at and specifically identified. You've been very patient. No one's fallen asleep. Well, not that they'll get to it. So thank you so much. Um, we have some time, I think, Annie, for questions. We do. Yeah. All right. Thank you.